Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we're going to return to U.S. Anderson, the great mystical teacher that wrote the wonderful book, Three Magic Words. And we've explored the lock, the illusion of evil, and the mystery of mind in previous episodes. Today we are going to talk about the secret of form, which is the chapter in Three Magic Words. This chapter deals with a whole variety of different topics, such as the consciousness of the atom, expanding consciousness, cosmic awareness, and even a discussion of the secret doctrine and its tenets. Anderson begins by saying, the universe hums like a great harp string, resounding a mighty chord, answering each thought by returning a thing from the place where all things are stored, the universal law. As far as the eye can see, the mind project and the spirit perceive there is nothing but eternal and immutable law. Working with the tiniest unit of matter, he can visualize man observes that the atom has a nucleus and moving parts which circle this nucleus in never ending motion. Working with the largest unit of matter which he can visualize, man observes that the solar system has a nucleus and moving parts which circle this nucleus in never-ending motion. How strange that the smallest and largest units we know are identical in their construction. Indeed, it is as if there were many mirrors in the mind reflecting one eternal law in infinite gradations of size. No doubt the atom contains many atoms of its own. No doubt, the universe is but a part of many increasingly greater universes. How small and lost we seem as we perceive the vast reaches of infinity. Yet all of our perceptions exist in mind, and just as surely as we perceive them, we are the center of them. Our premise is that thoughts make things, and in order to substantiate such a transcendent truth, we must turn to the beginning of all form. What is the one basic substance that permeates all space and all time? If we take apart a substance and discover atoms, and we take apart the atom and unleash energy, we must eventually say that the basic thing behind all form and all creation is energy. What, then, is this energy? It obviously does not explode helter-skelter throughout all space, but rather becomes apparent only in matter or in movement and always such matter or movement attains an intelligent existence or moves in an intelligent direction. The design and flow of all energy is such as to leave no doubt that basic and eternal in the universe are everlasting and immutable laws of action, which alone account for accumulation of substance into form. Inherent in these laws are movement and activation which set up the atom and the solar system alike, without regard to size, indeed lacking a specific viewpoint or a scale of relativity. The solar system and the atom are identical, as they assuredly must be in the universal subconscious mind. A living universe. This universal subconscious mind, this first cause, this infinite plan and energy, then, is the stuff from which all things are made, in its pure form, if indeed it is ever perceived as such, it is represented only by intelligent movement, or by a word which seems much more concisely to describe it, law. Its first intelligible manifestation is in a center of force, which on the smallest scale we know is represented by the atom, and on the largest scale we know is represented by the solar system. Nothing extraneous to the law calls into being these centers of force. It is the nature of the law to manifest them, for the law is one of life and movement and energy which, by its own nature, congregates itself into units of similar frequency in a vibrating universe. To consider this further, let us attempt to visualize all space as consisting only of vibration. We need not ask ourselves what is that vibrates, nor postulate as to what causes the vibration for the vibration is intelligence alone, and the force it exerts is of intelligence alone. 
The vibrations in pure universal intelligence are established on many different frequencies, and all vibrations of one frequency are inevitably attracted together to form a unit. This unit, this center of corresponding vibrations, we know as an atom or as the solar system, the first sign of visible form, the first evidence of tangible matter, called into existence by the very nature of infinite law acting within and upon itself. The formed atom also sets up a vibration and seeks out other atoms of a corresponding vibration. And in this coalescence of units vibrating on the same frequency, there is formed matter as we know it in our physical world. Thus, matter is formed from intelligence. And more important, intelligence is in matter. In fact, intelligence is matter. Since intelligence must be conscious, it is an indisputable fact that we are surrounded by a living universe, that there is consciousness in all things, the consciousness of the atom. Now you must bear with this very necessary discussion of the beginning of things and the nature of substance, for we are out to show that thought calls form into existence that form is no more than a part of the very intelligence that each of us lives in. Thomas Edison was extremely preoccupied with what he termed the obvious choice of the atom. In its infinite acceptances and rejections of the myriad combinations of chemistry, when two chemicals were put together in solution and some of the atoms of one combined with some of the atoms of the other, Mr. Edison was forced to ask himself why those particular atoms and not some of the others and indeed why any of the atoms at all. The only answer he could possibly conceive was that the atoms of each chemical exercised a conscious choice, whether they would or wouldn't combine with the atoms of other chemicals. Now, Mr. Edison certainly aired no views as to the self-consciousness of the atom, but only of the intelligence or consciousness of the atom. In other words, the ability of the atom to make a choice. The atom, the building block of the universe, is a center of force, and the atom is conscious. Working in accordance with law or universal intelligence, the atom seeks out other atoms which vibrate at corresponding rates, and the coalescence of such atoms form that which we designate as inanimate matter, water, earth, air, and minerals. Expanding Consciousness Now then, you may well say this is all well and good as a plausible theory as to the formation of substance in a living universe. But how do you account for life? Let us repeat, the entire universe is alive. There is nothing dead, nothing inanimate. This is the basic truth of all creation. For all is living, and all is intelligence, and all is conscious. And the great motivating force of all life is its attempt to expand its consciousness. In other words, it seeks to know itself. Though we can safely attribute consciousness and intelligence to the atom, there remains not the slightest possibility that the atom is self-conscious. In fact, all evidence points to the consciousness of the atom being of the lowest possible order. It chooses, but its choices are within the rigid scope of operating law. When a certain number of atoms begin vibrating together on a certain frequency and form, let us say, a rock, there is created in the rock a kind of consciousness which is on an infinity lower scale than that of the atom, for the rock exhibits practically no ability to choose, yet there can be no doubt but what there is actually a certain consciousness in the rock, for a group of conscious units must of necessity form a group consciousness. The rock exists, therefore it must be conscious. It consists of conscious intelligence and must then have some consciousness of its own, albeit so far below our level of consciousness as to be discernible to us. From the rock and sand and earth and water and air to the formation of the pain-pleasure responsive amoeba, a thing that grows and feeds and reproduces itself, what gigantic step is this? expanding consciousness, only that and nothing more. First, we have energy moving according to law, congregating into centers of force by its own nature, setting up polarization, nuclei of positive polarity around which revolve electrons of negative polarity. 
These centers of force or atoms have lives of their own, are conscious. The nature of these little lives is to congregate with others vibrating on the same frequency, and thus matter is called into existence, which is basically not matter at all, but merely units of intelligent energy. Secondly, we have all form consisting of many individual lives, building up to a conscious whole, building up to a conscious entity which attempts to work out its own purpose. From these two conclusions, we go on to a third, the form which results from the union of many individual lives, or consciousness, is the result of the consciousness of the whole. In other words, the form of the rock is the result of the consciousness of the rock. The form of the amoeba is the result of the consciousness of the amoeba, and the form of the human being is the result of the consciousness of the human being. Life seeks to know itself. Now, once again, you may say, this all sounds reasonable enough, but where does this consciousness come from? The entire universe is caught up in a mighty work of expanding consciousness, because it is the nature of universal intelligence to seek to know itself. God knows himself only as a thing. Before you shout blasphemy or irreverence, tarry a while and dwell on this premise. Visualize space. It goes on and on forever and ever. If in your mind's eye you retreat trillions of miles from the earth and draw a huge circle with the earth as the center and say, this indeed is all of space, what then is on the other side of your circle? The only answer is more space. Space as we know it, or infinite intelligence as we know it. Our universal law as we know it, or the universal subconscious mind as we know it, cannot possibly have any limits or any boundaries. How is it possible for something which is of no boundary to ever know itself? In order for it to know itself, it must be able to say, I am this. And in order for it to say, I am this, it must become something with boundaries, something finite, a thing. And that is exactly what the universal subconscious mind is doing. It is becoming things. It is seeking an expanded self-consciousness. And that part of it, which has achieved the greatest self-consciousness, which we are able to observe, is the human being. What is evolution? It is life expanding to a conscious oneness with God. As time progresses and our consciousness expands, we are growing closer and closer to this attainment. Indeed, this is the clue to the mystery of life and evolution and the destiny of man. Have no fear of your smallness in relation to the vastness of limitless space, for there are no limits to the mind and there are no limits to expanding consciousness. The destiny of mankind is that man's consciousness will expand to the point where he is one with all creation. On this great day, it will be as simple for one man to be in thought contact with another 5,000 miles away as it is now to speak to a friend in the same room. On this great day, the mind of man will span space and time and the limitations of form and existence will be solely of the spirit in one eternal now. The past, the present, and the future will be one. All space will be one. All form will be one. Man's consciousness will be the consciousness of God. Spirit into matter. All the great metaphysical and religious works speak of the evolution of consciousness as the descent of spirit into matter. The great allegory of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is an illustration. The temptation or the serpent, the eating from the tree of knowledge, the final fall, which culminated in awareness of self, speak only of the beginning of self-consciousness. This awareness of self as a thing of free choice was the beginning of man's conscious choosing of modes of action and methods of thought. It was the beginning of error, the start of evil, the beginning of sin and punishment, all natural results of man's search for truth. The great universal subconscious mind acting upon itself, according to the laws of its own nature, set up centers of force which are conscious and which attract other similar centers of force to form matter. 
this matter by the very nature of its overall consciousness, the sum total of the consciousness of all of its atoms, resolves itself into a particular form and seeks ever to know more about itself. As its consciousness grows, it becomes a living, expanding, feeding and growing entity, that which we designate a living organism. As an organism, its consciousness expands with ever-increasing rapidity, so that within a relatively short time, the expanded consciousness or spirit can no longer tolerate the limitations of its form, and abandons it. Thus is established the cycle of birth and death, such as exists in all living organisms. The process of evolution is now in high gear. The amoeba seeking to know itself unites with other amoebas and becomes a jellyfish. The jellyfish further develops its perception and consciousness and becomes a fish. The fish further develops its consciousness and becomes a mammal. The mammal further develops its consciousness and becomes a man. All along the path of evolution lie the many residual forms marking the way for wherever consciousness reaches out to a higher level, there also consciousness remains behind. The very process of the conception and birth and growth of a human being through the polywog, the amoeba, the low scale vertebrate, the fetus, and finally the human infant, which grows into the magnificent consciousness of man, illustrates with remarkable detail the entire path of the evolution of consciousness, cosmic awareness. Thus, it can be seen that the purpose of life is the attainment of knowledge, the expansion of consciousness, a constant reaching upward and outward and inward towards a oneness with God. Browning wrote, such men are even now upon the earth, serene amid the half-formed creatures round, who should be saved by them and joined with them form is but the result of consciousness and consciousness is but the result of thought. And thought is simply a contact and a borrowing from the universal intelligence that pervades all things. Thought makes form, thought makes things. Expanding spirit changes form. In this life, whichever seeks to know more about itself, whichever seeks an expanded consciousness, he who would stop death would stay an infant forever. For as the spirit expands its consciousness, it seeks new form through which to express itself. The body which you now occupy is but an instrument of your consciousness, an expression of your knowledge of yourself. By the very nature of your being, your consciousness must grow, and as it does, your spirit will gradually lay down your body and return again into the universal subconscious mind whence it starts anew in its quest for a new expression. This, of course, brings us to the subject of reincarnation. When you have truly understood there is only one life, only one mind, you will understand that this life incarnates itself billions of times over in its search to completely know itself. When you have understood this, reincarnation will be as obvious as knowing yourself, for you will know that there can be no life without an incarnation of the one life, which is in you which is altogether you, one, eternal, and everlasting. That is the truth about yourself, and the terror that death holds for many is simply vain regret at losing the built-up errors and illusions of the conscious mind, which is the silliest and most illusory fear of all mankind. We shall cover a great deal more of this in the chapter on immortality. Law into units of force, units of force combining into matter, the consciousness of matter determining its form, consciousness seeking self-consciousness, self-consciousness seeking the consciousness of the whole, the consciousness of God. This is the diagram of all life. For we are all one in reality, and our separateness is nothing but a necessary illusion in the plan by which the universal mind seeks to know itself by becoming a thing. The Eternal Presence Perception of the indwelling presence is often difficult to come by. The formative years of my own spiritual experience were certainly not spent in such knowledge. With chagrin, I recall how sorely I must have tried the patience of Dr. Elton Trueblood, 
then chaplain of Stanford University, when that gentle and erudite man tried to lead me out of the maze of my own circuitous questionings. Dr. Trueblood's excellent books are legion, and even at that date I had read a number of them. It was on the common ground of these texts and his own teachings in philosophy that we met afternoons in his study in the Stanford Chapel. Shafts of sunlight poured through the stained glass windows as we settled in our chairs and explored territory we had covered many times. To my openly voiced doubt of the existence of God, Dr. Trueblood offered the immense variety of religious experience undergone by men of high repute through the centuries. But they could have been deluded, I insisted. By whom? By themselves. Why would they delude themselves? Because they were afraid of their own smallness, afraid of oblivion at death. Dr. Trueblood smiled. Strange that some of them were otherwise very brave men, he said. But certainly if God exists, somebody in all the centuries would have seen him. Many people have. Who? I for one. You've seen God. Yes. Then what does he look like? Like everything. That means nothing. It means a great deal to me. I look at you and I see God. Wherever my eye falls, I see God. He is as real to me as you are. More real, in fact, for he is the changeless in the changing. The immutable and ever-present spirit that inhabits all things. In my mind, those words still sound on in the quiet air of the Stanford Chapel. Somehow, I sensed the meaning in them, even though I did not understand them. And as the years gradually enlarged my consciousness, then came a day when I looked on all things and saw God. On that day, my faith, weak and questing as it might have been, was tempered by the steel of knowledge. Unity versus separateness. Mental healing and creation of circumstances and form through thought may never be accomplished by him whose consciousness is one of separateness. But he who achieves the consciousness of the whole, the consciousness of God, may change form and circumstance and promote bodily healing through thought, for all things then will exist within him. At this point, we beseech you not to isolate yourself in your room and attempt to move a chair by thought power, nor indeed to attempt to exert any of the powers of the mind that your consciousness has not yet grasped. You must understand at once that it is not the impression of your will or your thought that will cause a chair to move without a physical force. It is only the final all-encompassing consciousness, a oneness with the intelligence in which you and the chair both exist. This consciousness has been achieved already by a very few individuals on very few occasions. There is good reason to believe that these individuals and occasions are on the increase certainly on the lower echelons of demonstrations such as the healing of the human body through mind power. There have been a multiplicity of authenticated and accurately recorded phenomena such as to remove all doubt of the supreme power of the universal subconscious mind. The Secret Doctrine There is in existence today a body of esoteric teaching which is aptly termed the Secret Doctrine and which for many centuries has been in the keeping of small groups of studious men who have learned its tenets and passed it down largely by word of mouth, though many allegorical texts exist in which it is described. This doctrine holds that the evolution of man will proceed through seven principal races and that we are now living under the great fifth race, which began with the civilizations in Persia, Egypt, and the Orient. According to the doctrine, the first race of man was largely spiritual, the second began to take on form, third produced a race of giants that inhabited the continent of Lemuria, the fourth inhabited the continent of Atlantis, and the fifth sought refuge in Europe and Asia after the deluge, referred to exoterically in the Bible in the allegory of Noah's Ark, to produce the materialistic age of today from whence man will revert once again to spiritual unity through sixth and seventh races. Those who attempt to substantiate this doctrine maintain that the continent of Lemuria existed in the South Pacific Ocean and offer as evidence the gigantic statues which can be found on Easter Island. These statues are between 27 and 30 feet high and show no evidence of having been built by scaffolding, but appear to have been molded by beings whose stature was approximately the same. As the Bible says, in those days there were giants in the earth. 
So the adherents of the secret doctrine maintain that colossal beings inhabited the continent of Lemuria, which was swallowed into the sea during a great upheaval in which the earth reversed its poles, leaving nothing above the surface but Easter Island and an archipelago of volcanic rock extending from the Marquesas Islands to New Zealand. These same adherents maintain that the continent of Atlantis was the home of the fourth race of mankind, and that this continent existed in the Atlantic Ocean, its easternmost part where we find the Azores today, and extending westward for several thousand miles. The men inhabiting this continent were supposedly 18 feet tall, and their civilization was such as to put our present one to shame. All of our present scientific advances having been made as well as the development of a culture far exceeding our own. As the secret doctrine has it, Atlantis was destroyed when the earth again reversed its poles. The water rose, Atlantis was swallowed into the sea, and its survivors, biblically Noah and his wife and their animals, found their home at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. The Tenets of the Secret Doctrine the proponents of the secret doctrine do not advance any reason for the periodic destruction of the various races of man's evolution. Their evidence of the existence of the races is sketchy to say the least, and they fail to be clear about the author of this plan, which they say has been irrevocably laid down for mankind to follow. But this much they are very firm about, that intelligence and law are the only realities, that mankind is evolving towards spiritual oneness, that is within man's grasp to attain universal consciousness and thus control all things. The history and course of man's future as expounded by the secret doctrine is difficult to accept, but we shall neither affirm nor deny it. Certainly recorded history takes us scarcely to the doorway of mankind's past, and if the secret doctrine is not correct, it is perhaps as allegorically correct as need be. It is safe to say that man's evolving spirit has inhabited other forms than we know today, and that the process of evolution has gone on perhaps for millions of years. It may even be that the earth turns over every so often, for the procession of the equinoxes is known to every astronomer. Which is simply another way of saying that the earth is slowly wobbling as it spins on its axis. Anyone who has observed a spinning top knows what happens when it begins to wobble in its spin. The secret doctrine also holds that there are superior beings in the universe who are watching and guiding man's evolution on earth, that these beings send their messengers or teachers to our world in the form of adepts, those whose evolution has progressed sufficiently to be able to gradually reveal the eternal truths to mankind. According to the proponents of the doctrine, Buddha was one of the adepts, as was Plato. No information is given about what part of the universe is inhabited by those who send their adepts upon the earth, but it is safe to assume that the inference is that these superior beings occupy the planets of our solar system or else the stars. Life on Other Worlds now it would be sheer blindness to maintain that higher evolved beings than man do not exist on other worlds in space. Indeed, since our premise is that all form is merely manifold differentiations of one supreme mind, since we believe that all is life and consciousness is everywhere, it logically follows that life exists on other worlds. Has this life evolved to our level or beyond it? We know already that some of the stars as well as a few of the planets are much older than our sphere. We know that some of the stars have climate conditions that may approximate those of the Earth. As each year brings us closer to the day when space travel becomes a reality, it also brings us closer to the time when many riddles will be answered. How the horizons of man will expand when he reduces the millions of miles of space to a comfortable journey how his thinking will change when he looses himself from the pull of gravity, when the unimpeded acceleration of action in space sets up such blinding speed in his vehicles as to even affect the passage of time. Then, indeed, man must look at the physical worlds about him and know of his unity with the only intelligence and law there is. The Relativity of Matter principle among the provocative phenomena man will encounter when he reaches new worlds is that of the relativity of matter. 
Today, our spectroscope reveals the existence on far-flung planets of elements that may weigh as much as hundreds of tons per cubic inch. Consider that man knows matter only in its relative density to his own body. We judge all substance according to its varying degrees of hardness and softness, in other words, its density, and that substance which is least dense and which is still perceptible we call a gas. The air around us is such a gas. As we move about in it, we are aware of it, but we move unimpeded so relatively scarce as its density in comparison to the density of our own bodies. A being whose bodily density was such that he weighed several hundred tons per cubic inch would move through our own bodies with even more ease than we move through the Earth's atmosphere. He would not even be aware of us, for his physical perception would of necessity be on an entirely different plane of matter. Such beings may conceivably exist on other worlds than ours. Others whose density is so slight as to be negligible in comparison to our own may also conceivably exist on other worlds. Matter is purely relative to the senses that perceive it. In its essence, it is pure intelligence, and it combines into such form as to be perceptible to whatever consciousness is attempting to perceive it. The element which weighs hundreds of tons per cubic inch is made of the same basic stuff as our own atmosphere. Intelligence molds it into form. Intelligence causes it to form. Intelligence is its form. Basically, it is neither more nor less than a conception held in the universal subconscious mind. The relativity of time. Spacious travel offers another startling promise, that of extreme speed and an entirely new concept of time. In free space, beyond all but a negligible attraction from interstellar bodies, a spaceship would float orbiting on some gigantic circle around whatever principal interstellar body it happened to be closest to. If a rocket were fired from the rear of this spaceship with such velocity as to create a reaction that accelerated the ship to a speed of 1,000 miles per hour, the spaceship would continue at this speed forever unless some impeding obstacle or attraction or friction were put in its path. If another similar rocket were fired from the rear of the spaceship, its speed would then reach 2,000 miles per hour. If another were fired, speed would increase to 3,000 miles per hour. If a thousand such rockets were fired, the speed of the ship would be 1 million miles per hour. Indeed, if sufficient numbers of such rockets were conceivably available, the speed of the ship could eventually be accelerated to 186,000 miles per second or 669,600,000 miles per hour. Since this is the speed of light, and according to Einstein, a limiting speed, we cannot go beyond it, nor, in fact, can we ever reach it exactly. His conclusion is that an object increases in size with its speed, and though the effect is negligible at lower velocities, it becomes startling as a mass approaches the speed of light. At this speed, Einstein maintains that a mass would become infinitely large. He also maintains that a minute becomes longer to those who travel at increased velocities than at the speed of light. Time actually stands still. Perhaps this is simply another way of saying that man cannot achieve the speed of light. Perhaps even more than that, it is a method of scientifically describing the complete basic unity of all things in a world where time and space do not exist. One thing is certain, new concepts of space and time and distance and substance will be in sore need the day man becomes free of the pull of Earth's gravity on his first adventure into space. The promise is there. The promise is within the expanding consciousness of the mind of man who will bridge all space and time, who will truly understand that he is the focal point of all creation the day he discovers that all things exist within him. Growing into understanding. We may at this moment seem far adrift for those of you who seek the solution to some specific problem in your life, but you must first understand what mind is. There are no words or formulas that must not first be understood. The key itself is as concise as a diamond, but we must be sure your consciousness has been expanded to the point where you recognize that conception and thought 
are the alpha and omega of all existence. Patience is the virtue you can best exercise now. Patience and practice of the meditations and thoughtfulness with the conceptions you are now entertaining and evolving. Concern with space and time and the nature of matter and form are as essential to you in expanding your consciousness as was your original resolve to realize peace and power. Be assured the road is well planned and charted. Reality versus Delusion What remarkable phenomenon are the myriad forms about us? Mountains, trees, brooks, seas, meadows, the infinite varieties of animals and vegetable life, the innumerable combinations of minerals, the astounding mechanistic forms made by the hands and ingenuity of man. Their variety and number are awesome. Yet we pass them by, regarding them as natural and normal in the scheme of things, giving little or no heed to whence they have come and of what they are made. How sure we often are in our little moments, in our little lives, in our little material worlds. We attach our fleeting securities to the forms around us, vainly try to build up a sense of permanence in a constantly changing material world, forgetting the enigma of our births and the inevitability of our deaths as we put our main goals on the accumulation of wealth and goods. Yet all form is made of the same basic substance as ourselves, pure and eternal intelligence, the universal subconscious mind and that mind and all it contains lies within each of us. To a being that weighed 300 tons per cubic inch, the chair in your living room could not exist. He would brush it aside as if it were not there. If he stepped upon it, he would crush it, but would never notice it. If the chair simply consists of atoms with more space between them than in the atoms, and if the atoms themselves contain more space than matter, if we regard as nothing other than pure intelligence, if certain matter such as the chair, which is such a concrete thing to us, cannot be perceived by a being whose density is millions of times greater than it is inescapably true that form may exist even though it is not perceived. Form is conception. This is an interesting and important point simply because the presence of the chair is not discernible to the being who weighs 300 tons per square inch does not obliterate the existence of the chair. Such a being would perceive only such vibrations of light reflected from substances with a density comparable to his. He would hear only violent vibrations of sound. If one of his fellow beings told him that the chair existed, he would snort and say that it, if it did, he could see, hear, feel, or smell it. One of his fellow beings pointed out to him that the place where the chair stood caused a slight variation in the quality of the light. He would insist that it was all just a crazy idea. But he would know that an idea was involved. That close to the truth, he instinctively would come. The chair would exist for him, but only as a conception. To him, the chair could only be an idea, a thought, which is all that the chair actually is in the first place. A conception in the universal subconscious mind made of the same substance as the universal subconscious mind. Now what we are attempting to illustrate is that form is no more than conception, that form is no more than an idea, that form always involves consciousness and that it is entirely representative of thought. It is pure essence. Form is constructed of exactly the same material from which a thought is constructed. Dual mind. Thus has evolved the duality of all of our lives, and we live upon two planes at once, the plane of mind and thought. In the physical plane of things and circumstances, our education and inhibition have been such as to teach us that thought has evolved in our attempt to deal with things, while the truth is, that things are no more than images that represent our thoughts. Such parallel was drawn by Plato in his cave, which represented the world. The men who lived within the cave by their very nature could look only on the wall of the cave where they observed their shadows cast by the fire behind them. These shadows they believed represented the truth about themselves. When one of them turned about and noted, that he was being gripped by an illusion, his fellows objected loud and long, labeled him deluded, and continued their observation of the flickering shadows. 
All truth exists within man, and never in the world about him. He who studies the world studies effects. He who studies his own mind studies the cause and source of things as they really are. The Fourth Dimension The world of science has long been working along the premise that we fail to grasp the full significance of form, that we do not see and observe a thing for what it really is. This extra quality of things science has labeled the fourth dimension, and many the tome and treatise has been written in an attempt to tell us in which direction the fourth dimension extends. Since the first three dimensions are each perpendicular to the other, science has insisted that the fourth dimension exists perpendicular to the other three. With our present conception of space, such a fourth perpendicular is obviously impossible, yet science continues its patient attempt to place a fourth perpendicular in space, for it knows that three dimensions cannot possibly answer the cause and the existence of the things it is studying. In a gigantic and complex volume entitled Tertium Organum, the Russian writer P. D. Uspensky postulates that life is evolving to the recognition of possibly seven dimensions. That each dimension, when unknown, represents itself as movement. For example, he says that the amoeba lives in a one-dimensional world. That each thing that crosses the line on which his consciousness lives represents to the amoeba only a point. On the next higher scale, the dog lives in a two-dimensional world, seeing and recognizing only width and height. Where the dog observes the presence of the third dimension, it is apparent to him as movement. To round out his conclusion, Uspensky says that we three-dimensional human beings are perceiving the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh dimensions as movement also, and when man has evolved the full way along the path he travels, there will be revealed to him an immobile universe possessing seven dimensions. Thus, Uspensky is able to posit four dimensions more than the normal three, and he finds them all existing in what we know as time, for movement is synonymous with time. Who dares dispute him? The world's greatest mathematical thinker has come to essentially the same conclusion, for he finds matter elongating itself according to its velocity until at the speed of light. It is everywhere at the same time, which is all time, and any time for time will then stand still, which is simply Einstein's method of saying that time and space and matter are one when the velocity of movement has reached infinity. A questing God What are these two outstanding thinkers driving at? Basically, they both see the same thing, that beneath the illusion of separateness there lies a great unity of all things, a unity in which space and time and individual form are all combined into one, an underlying infinite spirit or an intelligence, the universal subconscious mind. Here it is reasonable to ask, if this is so, what is the purpose of the illusion of separateness? What is the purpose of individual lives and individual things? And the only reasonable answer at which it is possible to arrive is that the universal subconscious mind is seeking to know itself by becoming things, that in effect it cannot know itself as infinity. The only possible conclusion is that there is only one purpose behind evolving life and that purpose is an expanding consciousness. God seeks to know himself by becoming a thing, thus human evolution is destined to expand self-consciousness to infinity. Viewpoint. The riddle of the universe is a riddle pure and simple. Like any other riddle, the true answer depends on a shift in viewpoint. If someone proposes a riddle to you, you put yourself in the place of each of the persons involved in the riddle. You attempt to get each of their viewpoints. When you have gotten each viewpoint, you translate them into one central viewpoint. Then the answer becomes apparent. It is viewpoint that gives us the illusion of separateness in life. It is this trick that consciousness plays on us that is forever provoking us into believing that we are negligible in the vast scheme of things. We sense that our consciousness is imprisoned within the fleshy limits of our bodies, and we presume that our personal eyes are forever limited to the few cubic feet of space that our bodies occupy. We see ourselves at the center of a tremendous universe. As far as we can see in all directions, there is myriad form and infinite variety. The very grains of sand upon a beach refuse to be counted through sheer number. 
Yet something within us keeps insisting, if I were not conscious and able to observe this, it would not be so. We analyze this statement somewhat sheepishly and admit that somebody else would be observing it even if we weren't, so it would still have to exist. What we fail to analyze is the personal, restricted, bodily, contained I. Who is I? Bill Smith, Jim Jones, Mary Stewart, every conscious organism and thing that exists refers to itself in exactly the same way, I. When anyone says I, he may think that he is referring to his name, where he was born, what he has done, every experience which he has ever had, but what he is actually doing, no more and no less, is simply saying here. He means that thinking consciousness, which is in a certain place, is having certain thoughts and sensations which it wishes to express through speech or movement. I am hungry. That consciousness which is here wishes to be fed. I wish to go for a walk. That consciousness which is here desires to move somewhere else. More than that, each eye is far from being a stable entity, but rather represents hundreds, perhaps thousands, perhaps even millions or billions of eyes. Shakespeare said all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players, and each man in his time plays many parts. Millions of parts are the lot of each person's, and each part represents another eye. On an expanding scale of consciousness, you're not the same eye as you were ten years ago, nor are you the same eye as you were one week ago. You will not even be the same eye when you have finished this chapter. You are only a particular eye at the particular moment, and the very next thought that traverses your mind makes you a different eye. On the succeeding moment, you are always a product of your thought and represent at any time the sum total of your thoughts to that moment. Each new thought adds or detracts from your consciousness. Your eye is different from anyone else's in the world, for only you have had the exact train and sequence of thought which make you, you. It is a practical truth that no two people have ever had, nor ever will have, the exact same train and sequence of thought until human consciousness has been expanded to the conscious of the universal mind. The Illusion of Isolation one of the biggest barriers in the explanation of the unity of life is that a person will say, if true mind is universal and in all things, why am I me and not someone else or even everyone else? And the only answer which is possible to give is that you are someone else and even everyone else basically. The differences you perceive between yourself and others is simply the difference between the thoughts they have had and the thoughts you have had, for each person is only what he thinks. It is true that your consciousness tends to lock itself within a finite body, and because you tend to say, my consciousness is here and nowhere else, it is difficult for you to perceive that you and your neighbor are one. How much simpler it would be if each thought affecting you and each thought you have had were identical in number and sequence with your neighbors. Your consciousness then would have to be the same. Could there be any doubt in your mind but what you then would both occupy in the same body? No two completely identical things in the universe. No two grains of sand. No two snowflakes. No two uh, trees. For the universe is engaged in making numbers of unlike things from a basic oneness. By its very nature, it cannot make two things which are completely identical. If two conceptions are completely alike, there is only one conception that will produce only one thing. The uniqueness of you. You are what you are only because of what you have thought. Because this thought is different from any person who has ever lived, you are a unique and separate thing in the universe. Most of your thinking is prompted by the sensations that come to you through your five senses, and since these belong to your finite body exclusively, you are constantly building up experience and thought that keep you locked away from your oneness with the universal subconscious mind. You tend to see all things about you as being external and different from you. You are at this stage of evolution acutely aware of self as a separate isolated being, but be assured the path upward leads to expanding the self-consciousness to include all things and in all life. The kingdom of God is within. We must understand that all forms and matter represent only the same intelligence that is in us. We must recognize that all of this intelligence is ours to draw upon, to understand, and use. 
We must know that thought makes form, that thought makes things, that thought makes us what we are. We must know that our separateness is only evolving consciousness, that basically there is complete spiritual unity in all life. We must strive constantly to expand our consciousness by identifying ourselves with everything and everyone about us. We must search in our quiet hours for contact with the universal subconscious mind, where all information and all thought have been indelibly impressed, which can guide us unerringly along paths of attainment and knowledge. We must understand the invincible power of thought, how it makes us what we are, how it creates form and brings circumstance, how it underlies and moves the universe. We must guard ourselves from being exposed to negative thinking. We must refuse to accept negative circumstance. We must, in our complete and positive expansion, in our soaring knowledge of the mighty work of the mind, teach our children to control their thinking, teach our neighbors to control their thinking, teach a suffering mankind that the way out of each of its dilemmas lies in the vehicle of its own thought, that the millennium is here, that the kingdom of God is within every one of us. Mind is greater than all. As you look about you at the panorama of your life, at the things that concern you, at the circumstances that involve you, expand your consciousness to include them as living parts of the fluidic medium in which you live. See through your own eyes a manifold living universe, which is constantly expressing itself by becoming an infinite number of things. Sense your complete oneness with each of these things. Know that the only real truth is intelligence and the only real form is thought. Somewhere behind the barriers established by your habits of thought, there exists this consciousness of the whole, the intelligence that knows all things, the universal subconscious mind. Nothing is impossible to this mind. All of its guidance and power are available to you. When you have fully realized that thought causes all, you will know that there can never be limits on you that you yourself do not impose. As we work more and more with intelligence and consciousness, we will learn to disregard size in relation to our own bodies by simply understanding that physical form and physical size have little or nothing to do with expanding consciousness. We may look on the vastness of space and the eternities of time with utter composure in the knowledge that mind alone is the answer to all things and mind need never be limited by space and time. Because a star lies a million light years away does not mean that you are small in the scheme of things. Does not your mind traverse this tremendous distance in an instant? See the power and scope of this mind of yours. So swiftly it dwarfs your body with such great power inherent in his very being. Is it not the worst of all evils for a man to place no trespassing signs on all avenues of thought and thus limit himself into poverty, disease, limitations, and lack of every kind? Nothing is impossible. All things are probable. Whatever the mind can conceive, the mind can do. Whatever the mind conceives, the mind does. There is only one way the path of evolution leads upwards. There is no limit to the heights to be assailed short of union with God. Man is the center of the universe. Our home is a whirling ball amongst whirling balls in ringed space. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, eternal captives of the sun, move in the immutable paths of infinite law. They are only specks in space. If the sun were a mile in diameter, Mercury would be 15 feet across and 36 miles away. Venus would be 38 feet across and 67 miles away. Earth would be 40 feet across and 93 miles away. Mars would be 20 feet across and 140 miles away. Jupiter would be 400 feet across and 480 miles away. And the last of the planets, Pluto, would be 20 feet across and 3,700 miles away. And this is but one of an infinite number of solar systems. He who is a materialist and would account for life as an accident amid the immeasurableness of material form is accounting for nothing. 
so small is man relative to the universe. Such a one may feel and touch his physical possessions each day much as Midas counted his gold. But when his spirit lays down his physical form and departs, he knows not where it provides no entourage or vans or railroad cars for the transport of those things upon which the materialist has founded his truths. Matter and substance and form are but instruments of our thought. But pawns in a reaching game of expanding mind, much as chess players might play their games in their heads were it not so much easier to do with a playing board and chess pieces. Man is the center of the universe, not in physical size assuredly, but in mind. For the universal subconscious mind is everywhere at the same time, and all of it is at any place at any time, and all of it is in man now. The Mighty Tool Form proceeds from mind, and mind controls all. And this knowledge properly applied can change your life. No longer need you batter at circumstances and things. No longer need you rail at the dealings of fate or frustrate your life against unwanted circumstances. Everything proceeds from mind. Everything proceeds from thought. And miracles are wrought in quiet hours in still rooms when awakened souls hearken their divinity. You, as a person, know you exist because you think and these thoughts of yours are far and away the most important thing you do. They are, in fact, the only thing you do. These thoughts of yours are the essence that makes forms, that brings circumstance. They are your sole tool with which to expand your consciousness. Accordingly, there is no more paramount thing for you to do than carefully select those thoughts that you will think, those beliefs you will adopt, those attitudes you will take for your own, for by them you will be what you will be. By them you have arrived exactly where you are today. If you mean for your life to be progressive and full of achievement, vigor, love, and abundance, you will abandon each negative thought the moment it is presented to you. You will refuse to accept on the plane of mind any conception other than those that are in tune with good. You will think only positively, and the universe will shower you with more good than you ever dreamed. Review 1. Basic and eternal in the universe are everlasting laws of action. 2. A vibrating universe acting upon itself evolves centers of force such as are represented by the atom and by the solar system. 3. These centers of force seek other centers of force with similar vibrations and by their coalescence matter is formed. 4. Since intelligent law makes up the center of force, the atom, which is the building block of the universe, is conscious. 5. We have our beings in the midst of a living universe. 6. There is no such thing as inanimate matter, for all form is made from universal intelligence and is but a conception in the universal subconscious mind. 7. That matter, which we call living, is simply that which has evolved sufficiently so that its consciousness is discernible to our senses. 8. That process which all life is caught up in is universal intelligence, seeking to know itself by becoming a thing. 9. Evolution is the path of expanding consciousness. 10. Developed self-consciousness, such as is now possessed by man, is a necessary step toward the development of universal consciousness. 11. Man's destiny is to expand his consciousness to complete unity, to a oneness with God. 12. Form proceeds from intelligence, for form is intelligence. Therefore, form proceeds from thought, and thought makes things. 13. All life is but an incarnation of the one life. Therefore, there are innumerable reincarnations until unity with the universal subconscious mind is obtained. 14. The secret doctrine has been held inviolate by esoteric groups for many ages and teaches that mankind is evolving toward spiritual unity. 15. The secret doctrine lays down the past and future of man's evolution, but this cannot be accepted as substantiated. 16. Matter is only relative and is nothing more than a combination of centers of force or moving intelligence. 17. Space and time are also relative and represent concepts in the universal subconscious mind. 
18. Man lives upon two planes at once, the plane of mind and thought, and the plane of things and circumstances, but actually these two planes are only one. 19. Your eye is a product of your thought, and is never the same from one moment to the next, except insofar as it is confined within the fleshy limits of your body. 20. The real eye is eternal, everlasting, only one, and contains all things. 21. The kingdom of God is within us. 22. You are what you think, and thoughts are things, therefore select your thoughts with care, patience. Still, we have not come to grips with concrete problems in concrete lives. And two more chapters are to be read before we undertake to teach specifically how to apply the laws of mind to the realms of love, success, and health. We moderns are an impatient people, and always the first thing we want to know is, what does it do? Then the minute we find out, we want to get on with it as quickly as possible. We would like to be the layman one day and doctors of medicine the next, the unnoticed one weak and famous the following. And even when we recognize this sort of thing as a possible miracle, we forget that the workers of miracles must serve their apprenticeships first. It would be foolish to teach the powers of the mind without first getting it thoroughly understood what the mind is. It would be folly to undertake the vast and exciting subject that engrosses us without recognizing that if such answers were obvious, they would long ago have been in widespread use by all mankind. Bear with us, the groundwork must be thoroughly laid. The Infallible Law You must understand that the teachings of this book are not to be regarded as patent medicines or wonder drugs. Things that work most of the time or some of the time are not at all. The law this book teaches works all of the time. And nothing or nobody on the face of the earth is big enough to stop it from working. We didn't make this law. We neither start it nor stop it. Our only purpose here is to impart it to you, a knowledge of its existence and methods of using it. The law works 100% of the time. It never fails. If you apply it to achieve success and you meet with failure, it isn't the law that has failed. It is you. You have simply failed to do the one thing that is necessary for you to obtain the slightest good, and that is to think only positively of that good. If an opposite develops, it has developed because you have been more convinced of it than you have of the good you want, and the law has still worked as it always must. The cynic is his own worst enemy. It requires far less skill to run a wrecking company than it does to be an architect. The world has been built by builders, and those who destroy have no alternative other than to dwell in desolation. Throughout the world, there are working groups who are envisioning the arrival of the kingdom of God, of man, who see in the thinking mind of man the object of his own liberation. Thoughts are things, they say. Things are thoughts. Awaken man to your sovereignty over all. Cast aside your enemies. Doubt, morbidity, fear, and guilt. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be open to you. You cannot dream a dream too big, nor aspire too high. Nothing is impossible. In our fourth meditation, we are recognizing all form and circumstance are but manifestations of the universal mind, that everything and everyone is made from and has his being in universal intelligence. Everything which you can conceive and accept is yours. Entertain no doubt, refuse to accept worry or hurry or fear. That which knows and does everything is inside you and hearkens to the slightest whisper. Fourth Meditation I know that all of life exists within me. Here, in my heart and mind, in the recesses of my being, there is utter calm, a place of unruffled and placid waters where the truth is apparent and the clamor of the world does not exist. I see about me the thoughts of all mankind, for these thoughts have become things. Whatever is good among these thought things I accept. Whatever is evil I ignore, for my concern is only with truth and understanding, which is forever the lovely and the good and the expanding. My mind moves easily to the furthermost reaches of space in all directions and just as easily moves back to me once again. I am the center of the universe. God, the universal subconscious mind, has made himself manifest through me. 
I know that my purpose in life is to reach ever upward and outward, to expand in knowledge and love and unity. I place my future in divine hands. I turn over each problem of my life to that great, all-knowing mind to which all things are possible. I do not tell God how to bring these things about. I have complete confidence that every circumstance that comes my way is part of a perfect plan to convert the image of my faith into physical reality. Even now the universe seeks to answer my every need. As I believe in my heart, so shall it be done unto me. This is the law of life and of living. There is greatness in my friend and in my enemy, for we are all brothers, seeking the same high mountain along many paths. God, who made all creatures, made no poor creature, for he made only of himself. I am prosperous, for God owns everything. I am vigorous, for God is all vigor. I need only open my mind and my heart, keep my thoughts in the path of truth. I am filled to overflowing with the power and abundance and love of the universe. And that concludes the fourth chapter of Three Magic Words by U.S. Anderson, a magnificent chapter, and really helps you to understand the concept of density. The beautiful description of the macrocosm and the microcosm is something I think about all the time, looking out into space and seeing stars and then seeing the atom and seeing the sort of reflection that we see from the microcosm to the macrocosm. And we're all playing a part of it. We are a part of it. This amazing proof that is given in the reasoning by Anderson that all of thought, all of form comes from a conception and is of substance. It may seem cliche and it may seem boring to you, but it's something that you really need to lock in. The phone that you're holding or the screen that you're watching is the same substance. The food that you're eating, the air you're breathing, all of it is the same substance. But you also get a sort of understanding of how there is a striving for a larger expansion of consciousness, which is discussed in the Law of One material. If you have any exposure to the Law of One material, you cannot help but be inspired by this particular section of Three Magic Words. Because you understand as we expand in our level of consciousness, we have a greater level of awareness, our density may change. And a higher density may not be aware of other densities. So fourth density may not be seen by the third density. They are completely different places. But we have this deep desire in man and woman to expand our consciousness to go to a higher level and that's what we see with all elements of evolution the amoeba desiring to expand becoming the jellyfish the jellyfish desiring to expand becoming the animal moving up from the animal and everything is these levels of consciousness on so many different levels we are all one life something that abraham continuously reminds us of when you watch anything from Abraham that it's all one incarnation we are just aspects of it so it's an exciting idea to really wrap your mind around and I think when you do you get a better understanding of what your thoughts actually are where they're coming from and how to create your reality so I'd love to get your impressions so far these meditations are all together on the universal mind meditation that I recorded uh, with the binaural recording and you can listen to them all in order but this particular meditation is great i love them it's a way of accessing the universal mind through a sort of understanding us anderson was a great writer and he talked about so many cool subjects in this one i really enjoyed reading this one i'm sending out love to everyone and that's a thought and i'm sending a thought of love and joy and bliss to everybody listening you're going to go out and have a fantastic day i'm honored and grateful that you've listened to this episode and it means so much to me all episodes of the reality revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to the reality revolution <laughs>